And now it is only appropriate that Suzanne Harjo have the final word uh, at this symposium. So welcome, Suzanne. Thank you so much, Kevin. Are we on here? Okay. Pardon me for not standing. In 1967, when we met after ceremonies at Bear Butte, South Dakota, Nawawu's Holy Mountain, our Cheyenne and Lakota and Arapaho and other elders had called us together and said, stay after ceremonies and for talk. They wanted to talk about things that were in the nightmares of people. And we talked about museums and other repositories that held our relatives and our sacred objects and cultural patrimony before we used terms like cultural patrimony. And we developed a coalition right then uh, in 1967 that would um, lead to the development and then passage of repatriation laws again before we use the term repatriation and it would not be it would be many years before we did that and we looked around and we talked to each other and we shared experiences about this museum or that educational institution or that federal agency that did terrible things to us and to our ancestors and who were holding them as prisoners of war. And they wanted out, they wanted back, and we wanted to rebury them. Or in many cases, bury them for the first time. So, and we were doing ceremonies that required certain objects that were in these museums and other repositories, we wanted those things back that were, that were needed for ceremony. Now keep in mind that we didn't have at that time the buffalo herds that we have now on Indian lands, and we hadn't had the opportunity to really watch them and how they move and how they how they line up from the biggest to the smallest. We didn't know their ways except through ceremony. But when Native nations started developing the buffalo herds that we have today, we would look at them and say, that's why we do the buffalo dance that way. <laughs> we knew them at one point. Well, it's like that with the sacred objects we knew what we were looking for in these repositories. We knew what had been taken away from us. We knew what had been confiscated when all of our traditional manners and ways were criminalized from the 1880s to the 1930s in the civilization regulations, which we point out in the exhibit and in the book. We knew what we were looking at. We, were, we knew what was missing from our ceremonies. It might not be the focal point, but it might be very important pieces that we were looking for. And it only took from 67 to 89 to actually craft laws and have Congress pass them that would provide a process for the return of our people and of our things for our ceremonies. It was also at that meeting in 1967 that we asked each other, is there any place that you've ever encountered? Are there any people you've ever encountered who are doing it right? And we looked at each other and no one had ever been treated well 
No one had ever been respected. No one had ever been believed. No one had ever been accommodated. And certainly, our people hadn't been returned, and our sacred objects had not been returned. So there, we began to envision what it would be like for a place that would do it right. And this is the place we envisioned. We envisioned it here. Now, we didn't call it a museum at that time. We called it a cultural center. We changed over time uh, to fit the realities of Washington and the Capitol Mall and legislation and the Smithsonian and all things that we learned. But in 1967, we called it a cultural center. And we said it has to be right in front of the Capitol so that the people who are in the Capitol, the policymakers who are making laws about us, have to look us in the face when they do it. This is that. And Kevin is absolutely right that we would not have been able to do this exhibit any time before now, for one thing those of us who wrote pretty much uh, the, the deadlines in, in the laws uh, in the National Museum of the American Indian Act set a, a rigorous set of deadlines for opening the museum facility in New York, opening the Suitland, Maryland site, which had to be built from the ground up, and opening the museum on the mall, the one we had envisioned 22 years before the legislation was signed. We had to do that. We had to raise money for that. We had to, because we required a public-private partnership. And the Native nations were just being capitalized and, and gaining money through all sorts of business enterprises, including some of them a handful of them uh, in, in gaming. So all of this kind of converged at the same time and we began this glorious enterprise of this museum, this cultural center, this center where we have a place at the table just as the repatriation laws required that we have a place at the table and took us from a situation where we were just the property of the United States or the property of the museums to a place where our human rights were respected. So we moved in that legislation from property to human rights. That's a huge dif distance. And if you wonder why it took 22 years to do that, that's why. That's the main reason why. So there are all sorts of reasons we did not do this foundational exhibit before now. This take, it's enormously complex, the treaties exhibit. Now everyone will look at this exhibit and say, oh, I know how to do that better. And, and some will do it better. You'll have a lot of treaty exhibits that'll be done and a lot of them will be better. This is the first one. And it's so difficult. And so these are the head, headwaters. And you don't just launch right away into, into rivers and little streams before you construct the headwaters. So think of this in that way. And for those who come after to, who will look back and say, we're going to improve on that, think of us kindly. So I was the youngest person at that uh, meeting in 1967, except for my daughter, who I was carrying on my hip. And uh, the, now um, that I'm one of the elders, I'm, I'm uh, looking back and saying, did you really think that you were going to spend all of that time doing this kind of thing? Well, maybe I wouldn't have chosen it, but this is how it worked out. And I see that there are very direct lines that have led 
from that meeting to this time, and one of them is about treaties. Treaties are in my family on both sides. I'm Muskogee. Um, on my dad's side, culturally Muskogee, raised in that way at Nyaka grounds, was our ceremonial ground, still is, uh, and through my grandmother, Hodulgi Muskogee, and my citizenry is in the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma. I'm a Cheyenne citizen. And on both sides, and my mother was Cheyenne. My mother's great-grandfather was Bull Bear, who signed the 1867 Treaty of Medicine Lodge Creek, which provided for for exactly what our ancestors asked President Lincoln for, and he agreed in an unwritten treaty in 1863, uh, movement to Indian Territory. We're the ones who wanted to go to Indian Territory while the Muskogees were dragged kicking and screaming at bayonet point and at gun point, and many people were killed because they didn't want to leave their homes. So very different kinds of experiences that I learned about growing up. In fact, the Muskogee people, and maybe other people, but certainly the Muskogee people say that the reason that so many Muskogee people in Oklahoma, on the east side of Oklahoma, are Republicans is because Andrew Jackson was a Democrat. <laughs> Every time I go to an ATM machine, I get heart palpitations because it's Jackson, 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 Jackson. <laughs> So we have a very long view, a very long memory, but a very long view, too, backward and forward of history. The Cheyenne people are still waiting for the return of our Fort Reno lands. Fort Reno was built on our treaty lands that um, my mother's ancestor, Chief Bull Bear, was the first signatory to because, and why? Because no one else would sign. Everyone knew that the treaty wouldn't be valid on the Cheyenne Nation side unless he signed because he was both the peace chief and the head of the Dogmen Society at, at a time when the Dogmen Society comprised over half of the Cheyenne Nation. So his is the first signature on, on that particular treaty. We're still waiting, though, for the return of the Fort Reno lands, which were supposed to come back to us when they were no longer used for a fort. But we've had the federal agencies passing our Fort Reno lands out amongst themselves. So we have a, sim a, a penitentiary there, the Fort Reno, or the El Reno Penitentiary is on our treaty lands, on our Fort Reno lands. The um, Agriculture Department, from time to time, puts animals on there. Uh, they wanted to put monkeys. They kept the Cheyennes and Rabahos out, but they wanted the monkeys in. And so every so often, I'll drive by when I go home and, and count whatever animals they have, just to make sure I know. And one time I went, and well, there are llamas. There are actual llamas walking around the, our Fort Reno lands. <laughs> and we can't go there, but the, but the llamas can walk around. So at that point, I've, I counted 75, and, and we'll see uh, what animals are there. So we, we keep trying to get our lands back acre by acre. We keep trying to get our waters back bucket by bucket. We don't want everything. We want some of what was guaranteed to us in the treaties that we negotiated in good faith. And 
whether or not the United States or any particular president like Andrew Jackson has been horrible to us. We look at it with a long view and say, the United States did not keep its word here or here or here, but is beginning to now. And in some cases, we believe that. In some cases, we don't, depending on who you are, what your family experience is, what your nation's experience is. So that's how we view this keeping of word that one, one of the people we interviewed for this treaty exhibit, and I don't want to forget him, uh, Maurice John, who was on the board of NMAI, uh, a Seneca man who used to be a, a tribal leader there, he said, he said, I don't think the treaties have been broken. I think they've been stretched and stretched and stretched to the breaking point. But I think they're still good treaties. So some people have a view of that, the, the elastic nature of a person and a country keeping its word. And what we're part of here is the maturation of America. We're giving back to America part of its American history. And this just isn't our, our history. The treaties aren't just our treaties. The treaties are the United States and the Native Nations. So we individual Native people are like the individual American citizen who will be coming here and who will be looking at this and saying, how can I help my country keep its word? What do I need to do? So that's what I'm hoping for this exhibit, just as I hoped for this museum, that it's a place for big ideas and for attention to small detail so that we can find a way of going forward that is as this two-row wampum of the Haudenosaunee and the Dutch ever so long ago provides for peace and friendship forever. That's profound. And that's the basis for all the treaties, is peace, friendship, forever. Now, the treaties of removal, under the Removal Act, you had to have a treaty. So in some cases, Jackson, I keep mentioning his name because he is a despicable being in our history. <laughs> I'm sorry, Democrats. <laughs> I, I'm a Democrat, <laughs> but I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> uh, very, very um, uh, terrible things he did. And it, he and other treaty commissioners coerced Native people. They bought them off. They got them drunk. They did a lot of things in order to get that bad paper that would allow them to say, we've got a removal treaty. And then people would be hauled off to Indian Territory, some less willingly than others. Now, our Muscogee people, once they heard that there was someone, some rump group that had signed a removal treaty, they went to Washington, D.C., to the Senate, and demanded that the Senate vitiate that so-called treaty. They said, we're the Muscogee Nation leaders, and we did not enter into that. That's an invalid treaty. We want it vitiated. Now, I bet there's not one person, one American in a thousand, who knows what vitiate means, <laughs> and who might know that it's still a rule of the Senate and that senators can vitiate an action, can make it as if it never happened. 
if they, if they want to, if they all agree. So the Muscogee Creek Nation people were moved against their will and without a valid treaty of any kind, and one that the Senate had agreed was not a valid move. So by vitiating that one piece of paper that they had from some people who had claimed to be Muscogee people and speaking for the nation. That suggests a level of sophistication that I'm pretty impressed by. That there were many Muscogee people who spoke many languages, for starters, there are many languages within the Muscogee Confederacy. There were 60 nations and tribal towns. So that's a lot right there. And not all of them spoke Muscogee. The Yuchis uh, speak a language that's more like the Sioux people speak, yet they're part of the Muscogee Confederacy, just not by language. So they were speaking all those languages, or many of them, plus Spanish, many of them, plus French, plus English. And in English, they knew enough about process to know about vitiation as a rule of the Senate. And that was in the 1830s. It's a lot of knowledge to have back then, and it's a lot of knowledge to have today. Now, I'm really impressed by our ancestors and what they were doing. I'm impressed by the United States Supreme Court when it keeps its word and when it says treaties are to be understood as the native peoples understood them at the time. It's pretty, pretty impressive. I think that suggests a level of sophistication back then that we don't have right now in some cases. People do grow, people do learn, countries do grow, and countries do learn. The, when we were trying to get an apology for the Wounded Knee Massacre on the occasion of the centennial of the massacre, so this was in 1990 that we were trying to get an apology, the Wounded Knee Survivors Association, the descendants of those who had survived the Wounded Knee Massacre, they wanted an apology. So Mario Gonzalez as their attorney and myself were trying to get this for them. The South Dakota senators would not allow the word apology to be used. Would not allow it. So and our, a lot of our good friends, Senator Noway was one of them, took to the Senate floor and declared that it was an apology. Because our people were saying, or the Lakota people and the Dakota people and were saying, they won't let us use the word apology. I tried to slip it in. I entitled one draft, In Memoriam and Apologia. <laughs> <laughs> And it went through everyone. And then right at the end, someone said, wait a minute. <laughs> so, they eventually agreed that they wanted the apology and believed in the people in the Senate who said, we're passing this because it's an apology. They believe that. And the South Dakota senators, you know, one went on to greater glory and now lesser so. And another one is trying to return to Congress. Uh, and part of his platform in Indian country is saying, I guarantee you that I'll put in a bill for a Holocaust museum. <laughs> <laughs> so people do change and people do grow. And sometimes it's just back and forth, and sometimes it's, it's in the wrong direction. But some people are steadfast that they will not admit that anything wrong happened to the Native people. 
the world knows what happened to Native people. The world doesn't know the details, but the world knows what happened to Native people. And that's the big deal thing for, for us. And what we're trying to do as Native people, what we're trying to do as a group of people who were working our hearts out to bring to everyone this history of treaties and how, how can we present it and what can we present about all of the treaties? How can we distill that down and make it an important statement through time? How can we, how can we urge people to abide by protocol, by the words of treaties? by the word of the United States and the word of Native nations. How can we urge that? Well, first you have to inform the people. And a lot of people don't understand that these are legally binding contracts. These are agreements. These are things that stand through time that are still being litigated, are still being discussed, and will form and inform future Congresses when they straighten out and talk to each other and begin to look at some decisions that have been made about treaties that have just been wrong. Like too much time has passed, you can't uphold a treaty for land rights because too much time has passed. What nonsense. No one put a time limit on it. Congress didn't. The Senate didn't when it ratified that. So you can't just say, well, let's just apply latches. And why? Because it would be too disruptive for the people who now have the land if you applied treaty rights. Well. That's like saying, okay, the second story guy got all your stuff, but now his descendants have it and have been using it and think it's theirs, so you'll just have to give it up because it'll be too disruptive to his descendants if you are allowed to claim those those things as yours. Say, well, but that was my mother's, that was my grandmother's, that's, that's what we buried our ancestors in. This is that. So we need to really look past today and look to the little kids that are going to be educated by this exhibit. To look to the teenagers who come in who can be educated by this exhibit and look to the policymakers who can still be educated even though they're adults. Because I guarantee there's something in this exhibit that someone will hit their head about and say, really, that happened? I had no idea. And if you find only one thing that you didn't know, you're a genius. <laughs> and you have inherited more of the collective wisdom than we were able to put together in 11 years developing this, this exhibit. Uh, there, there have been amazing people working on this exhibit uh, in this museum and starting with the treaty experts, native and non-native, who advised myself and Vine Deloria, who was co-curator and who was our leading treaty expert, who advised us for years and talked to us about the kind of thing that could be presented well and not, and we also had people who really knew exhibits and who knew, who knew art. I mean, we all know a little bit about a lot of things, but when you put that collective wisdom together, then everyone 
has their knowledge increased and everyone knows a lot about a lot of things. So that's what we were doing and building more and more people with a greater and greater knowledge mass. And that's, you know, I hope that we've been able to do that within this museum. And I know that there are people, uh, very specific people within this museum, uh, the, the greatest of them being Kevin Gover, uh, who really has been more of a co-curator with me um, it, for this, this exhibit. Uh, in, in very recent years, in addition to being director and all the things that he has to do there. And why? Because he knows this work. He knows this, this area of law. He knows it from a particular way of understanding it. And we actually were able to, to bounce ideas off each other and to say, what kinds of um, people do we want to hold up? What kinds of people do we want to raise up? And what kinds of treaties do we want to honor? And how can we do that? How can we best do it? So here we are after all of this time with an exhibit that I hope people will respond well to and we'd be very interested in knowing, you know, good reaction, negative reaction, uh, uh, any kind of reaction that you have, uh, more of this, less of this, more like this, and to go forward and do something about treaties in your own area, whatever your area is, the law, policy, art, what, whatever, you know, in the classroom, what, whatever you can do in what area, whatever area you, you're involved in, uh, especially education, if you can bring to bear uh, this level of discussion in, on the future generations, then we're going to make more and more people who think it's an honorable and a decent and maybe even a cool thing to keep your word. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. We've heard so many wonderful words from our panelists that we're actually going to allow you to ask questions of them individually as we all move up to the fourth floor for the book signing, uh, the reception, and a chance to actually see the exhibit. So um, please join me once again in thanking the panelists, and we'll see you up on the fourth floor. Thank you.